I wanted to welcome you to the Redeem Mind podcast, where you'll hear Bible commentary for Christian living. I'm your host, author and professor David W. Jones. In this podcast, you'll hear chapter by chapter teaching from the Word of God as we make our way through the biblical text. It's my prayer that the messages here will help you better understand the scriptures and will equip you to live the Christian life. If you're ready to begin, grab your Bible and a pen and paper, because here we go. All right, we have a great uh, lesson today in Isaiah chapter 49. So it's week 10 uh, of our study of the book of Isaiah, and I'm looking forward to diving into uh, this passage here today. Uh, And so last week we talked about the foolishness of idolatry uh, and just the, the fact that how mankind is is predisposed to make idols to worship, and God claims um, worship from us. And so, whenever we we worship anything else uh, other than the Lord, uh, it becomes uh, essentially a sin of commission, and that we are worshiping that which we should not. And it becomes a sin of omission, and that we're we're not worshiping God. Uh, as we ought. And so it's just so important, as Isaiah taught in last week's passage, you know, that we focus our affections uh, on the Lord uh, and make him ultimate uh, in regard to, to all things. And so moving on to today's chapter, Isaiah 49, um, we're going to see here that Isaiah um, describes for us uh, this, this servant, uh, this servant of God, uh, who ultimately, uh, we're going to say, is, is Christ. But this, this passage is really, really important because one of the things that Isaiah is known for uh, is that in these, these last um, you know, 20 chapters or so of, of his book, he gives to us what have been uh, termed uh, uh, servant songs. Uh, there are four servant songs uh, that are contained here that really start back in Isaiah uh, 42. Let me give you the passages uh, that contain the servant songs. The first one is in Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. The second one is in Isaiah 49, 1 through 6, which is part of today's passage. There then is a third one in Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 7. Then the fourth servant song, probably the one that you are most familiar with, is in Isaiah 52, 13 through 53 and verse 12. Uh, and these these four uh, separate ser- uh, servant songs, sometimes called servant poems, uh, are important because Isaiah is describing this this servant, uh, this suffering servant, as he's called in Isaiah fifty three, um, who ultimately is is Christ. Uh, and so, what Isaiah is doing here, uh, hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, is he is describing. Christ. He's describing the Son of God who uh, was the servant of God, the ultimate servant of God. He even describes, as you're familiar, in Isaiah 52 and 53, he describes his his crucifixion uh, in in some detail, uh, as the gospel writers um, tell us. And so these four um, servant songs, uh, again, unique in that describing this uh, this servant who was to come, uh, who is, is ultimately uh, Christ and the uh, New Testament writers will quote from these these four songs repeatedly in order to um, make the point uh, that Christ is uh, is the promised Messiah, that he is the servant of God. He is the servant of man uh, and, and dying for us, as we're told as well in the New Testament. And so Isaiah 49, uh, we'll cover the, the whole chapter here, but we're going to focus on these first um, uh, 13 verses first. And in, and in particular, uh, these first six or seven verses that contain this uh, this song, uh, this servant song. And so Isaiah 49, starting in verse 1, um, it says this. It says, Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples, from afar. And so this actually, this is the servant who is speaking. Uh, and he's calling, uh, calling mankind, he's calling the coastlands, He's calling the world, essentially, to pay attention uh, to himself uh, and to look unto him. It says, The Lord called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name. And so this is really similar. I thought of uh, the book of Jeremiah, actually, in reading this. In Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah describes his call 
um, to serve the Lord. And in Jeremiah 1, I think it's verse 5, let me read you what Jeremiah said about his call. He said, before, well, he's, he's quoting God, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. And so Isaiah was called to serve God before there even was an Isaiah. Right? And so this idea of, of God unfolding this sort of plan. Well, here in, in Isaiah, or rather that was Jeremiah, here in Isaiah 49, so um, this servant uh, is talking about the Lord's call of him, calling me from the womb, uh, from the matrix of my mother. Uh, and so he's, he's speaking in, in, in the terms of, of mankind, right? You know, in Christ, indeed, he was incarnated. He was born. It was a divine act. And certainly uh, he was Christ from the moment of his conception. I even I think of that narrative there in Luke's gospel, you know, where uh, Mary uh, meets Elizabeth, right? The uh, and the um, they're both they're both expecting, uh, and the baby leaps uh, in the womb, right? Because John the Baptist uh, is the one who heralds the call uh, uh, of the the coming of Christ, and so uh, I mean Christ was always Christ, but understand that that he was not called just in the womb, or even before the womb. That you know he was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, right? The, uh, he's, he's always been uh, Christ. He's always been the Messiah. He's always been the one uh, who was destined to come and to redeem mankind. Uh, and so he was called really from eternity past, uh, not just uh, in the womb. And we see several verses um, that even say this. Let me read you one. Over in 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, Peter, um, he says this about Christ. He says um, that we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest only in these last times. And so Christ was ordained of God. Uh, he was elect of God. He was chosen of God. He was designated as the Messiah uh, from eternity past, before there even was a foundation of the world, before there was anything. Uh, he was Christ. So this is his call. And so he's saying, hey, look to me and know that I've been part of God's plan forever. Verse 2, he says, and he has made his mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver he has hidden me. <laughs> so there, you know, some verses come to mind, right? I, mean, I think of Revelation 1.16, Revelation 19.15, I jotted down, where we see Christ returning on a white horse at the end of the age. And what is there? There's a sharp sword coming out of his mouth, right, that he uses to judge the world. Hebrews 4, in verse 12, another well-known passage. I love what the author of Hebrews says here. Hebrews 4 uh, and verse 12, we read this. For the word of God is living and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of thoughts and of the intents of the heart. <laughs> and so it's the idea that, you know, we, as we experience, as we read the word, you know, these ancient words in scripture, that they impact us not just intellectually, but they impact our hearts and our minds, and they change and they conform us, and they convict us, and they edify us, and they nourish us. And this is what the Word does, because it is, it is sharp. It's a, it's a sword. It's a, a living Word. And of course, Christ is the ultimate living Word who gave us the written Word. And whether it's Christ or it's the Word recorded, so it has the same impact on us, that of conviction uh, and sanctification. Verse 3, he goes on and says, And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And so, hey, this is interesting here, right? Because the servant who is talking, who I've said is Christ, well, here, God calls his servant Israel. And so, is the servant Israel, or is the servant Christ? Well, the answer is, is yes, right? Because Christ is the greater 
Israel. Christ did what Israel was supposed to do, right? Israel was supposed to serve the Lord, become like God, and share the message of hope with the world. Of course, Israel didn't do that. Christ came, not as plan B, but to fulfill that uh, that charge uh, and as the word. So Christ kept the word and Christ spread the word to the world. And so sometimes in scripture, uh, Christ is called Israel. But we know that the servant here uh, is not Israel the nation, not in a ultimate sense, in a, in a perhaps limited sense. As we'll see here in the passage, it is talking about the Jews in captivity in Babylon and their release. But ultimately, that was a picture of the work of Christ to a- address our captivity to sin and to release us uh, into joy and flourishing with him. And so he says, um, and he said to me, Oh, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord, and my work is with my God. And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. And so you see here, it, 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 the servant can't just be Israel. Because here the servant is talking about Israel, who will be gathered to him. Again, Christ is the servant. Christ is the greater Israel. It was the work of Christ that brought Jacob back to him, that brought Israel back to him. The church is called the Israel of God because of Christ's work on the cross and our redemption. The church became the people of God uh, and, and are feasting on the promises that God made to his people Israel in the Old Testament. And so it was Christ's work that gathered Jacob, that gathered Israel to him. And we know Romans 11, in the end times, there will be this gathering of ethnic Israel to the Lord. And so you see, we see all these levels of fulfillment of this great work of the servant uh, of God whom we, whom we follow. And he goes on here uh, and he says, Middle of verse 5, he says, For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? That's you and I, the church. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. There it is. And you that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nations abhor, to the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship. Because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. So here's here's this sort of promise um, that uh, the work of the servant, the work of Christ, well, we read here, as the servant, you know, in a sense, he laments, he talks about, he says um, in verse 4, he says, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. And this is just what John says in John 1 verse 11. Uh, John says that Christ came to his own and his own did not receive him. Right? His labor was in vain in regard to the salvation of ethnic Israel um, during his incarnation in the gospel narratives. But it wasn't in vain because it produced the Gentiles uh, coming to worship him. It it produced the kings of the earth, verse 7, to arise and the princes also to worship him. And so this is this picture sort of of the Gentiles, the people of God, the Israel of God, the church coming unto Christ ever since the cross, and so while in a limited fashion, when Christ died on the cross, Israel rejected their Messiah, but the Gentiles accepted their Messiah. And ever since that time, for 2,000 years now, so the Gentiles and the kings of the earth uh, have been coming to him. And we know that in the end times, thus everybody will come to him. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, let me read you this, you know, Interesting passage here. Uh, I wish we could we could unpack Philippians, uh, you know, two, um, I, like I like I would like. But let me just read you just a few verses here. Philippians two, starting in verse nine. 
Therefore God also has highly exalted Christ and given him the name which is above every name. Why? That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so an important teaching there in Philippians 2, because what we see here, Paul is talking about the end times, that in the end times, everybody, both lost and saved, will bow the knee and confess that Jesus is Lord. Now, of course, it'll be uh, in, in heaven or on the new heavens and new earth that the saints will do this. But even those who are separated from God, he says everyone will eventually confess that Jesus is Lord, just as the demons believe that he's God and tremble, James 2. So even at the end of the age, even those who will spend a Christless eternity in hell, even they will admit, yes, he is God. Yes, he was right. Yes, the gospel is true. Uh, And yes, we are deserving of the punishment that we're receiving for rejecting him. And so, while his work again was in vain in a limited sense there at his death on the cross ever since that time, so people have been pressing into the kingdom. And at the end, all will admit that he is who he said he was. Isaiah 49, verse 8. Thus says the Lord, he goes on and says, In an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. So this is interesting here. So don't miss this this change here uh, in the speaker. And so in Isaiah 49, 1 through 7, it is the servant. It is Christ who's talking to the world. But here in Isaiah 49, verse 8, we shift the speaker. It says, thus says the Lord. And now it's no longer Christ, the servant, speaking to the the coastlands, to, to the world, verse 1. But now it's the Lord, it's the Father, it's God speaking to the servant, speaking to the Son. And so what a great privilege we have here to look into Isaiah 49, uh, 8 down through verse 13, where we have this sort of uh, this window where we're getting to see this, this discussion. It's really a monologue between the Father and the Son. This is an actual conversation they had. In eternity past, this is what the Father said to the Son before there was anything. And and this is what he says. He says, In an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. I will preserve you and, and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, Go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. And so here he's describing, the Father's describing the effect of the Son's work as the servant on the cross before it happens. And so this is what happens in your life and in my life. We start to flourish. Uh, We're set free as prisoners. We are preserved by him. And it's all because of this promise that he's made, this covenant to the people to redeem and to restore. There's more. He says, middle of verse 9, They shall feed among the roads, and their pastures shall be on desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even the springs of water he will guide them unto. I will make each of my mountains a road, and my highways shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, and these from the lands of Sinim. He says, Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people, and he will have mercy on his afflicted. And so here the Father is describing the effect of the gospel upon the world. Uh, And he says uh, actually six separate things I just read that will happen. He says, speaking to the Son, he says, first of all, I have heard you. He says, secondly, that um, he promises to protect the servant. Thirdly, God informs the servant that he will rescue his people. Fourthly, God notes that the servant will provide abundantly for his people. Fifthly, God describes the easy path um, 
to the servants uh, for his people, the mountains being made low, the paths being clear, as we read there in verse 11. And then sixthly, he says that God, um, God's people will come from afar to worship his servants, right? They'll come from all lands and they'll worship. And this is what God has promised the Son. He's promised the Son us. In, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, 11, and following there, in that passage, um, you know, God calls us the church. He calls us uh, his inheritance. Uh, and so we are his inheritance, that the Father promised the Son the church as this great love gift to worship him forever and ever in eternity past. Uh, and so this is exactly what has happened. It's what is happening. The church is growing. The kingdom is flourishing. And while the world is falling apart, you know, I was just, just thinking about this earlier this week, you know, in, in the midst of this time of chaos that we're living with elections and violence and everything going on, you know, it's never been more clear <laughs> that, you know, the cultural institutions and all of the resources of mankind, all the governments of man will not save. Every, everything is falling apart. But what's not falling apart? Uh, the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for his people. Uh, and the church is unchanging. The church is growing. Uh, the kingdom is flourishing. And God is at work in a way that is so effective, but yet is so hidden from the watching world. But we know it's true, and we experience it as his followers. Well, be encouraged as the Son is encouraged by the Father, uh, that God has got this. He's over all things, and he is at work. Well, he goes on here and starts to say some other things, and starting in verse 14. Uh, and starting in verse 14, there's an, another shift in the speaker, right? And so the first seven verses, it's the, it's the son, the servant, speaking to the world. In 8 through 13, it's the father speaking to the servant or to the son. But then starting in verse 14, he personifies uh, the people of God. He personifies Israel, whom he calls Zion, which is, is another name for Jerusalem. And he, he personifies uh, God's people um, as a woman uh, who is lamenting uh, the captivity uh, that she was experiencing, God's people, in this context. While these promises were all designed to be encouraging and are great and are really um, unfathomable, in the then context of those reading this book, they were in captivity in Babylon, right? Uh, and it seemed like the world was winning uh, and it seemed like they had been defeated. And there they were. Uh, and in that context, he personifies Israel, God's people, uh, and, he, and he complains or she complains about her context. So verse 14, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Right? I mean, just as you and I react, right? When we lose our job, when our kids are going crazy, when our spouse leaves us, when, when we get diagnosed with cancer, you know, whatever happens in our lives, right? The, um, you know, we claim, we think, well, God doesn't know. God doesn't care. God doesn't love me. Like, you've forsaken me. But God says, no, 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 no. Uh, it, it's verse 15. In 15, really down through verse 21, this is now the Father again uh, speaking to to us. So he spoke to the servant in 8 through 13. Here in 15 through 21, he speaks to us, those of us living in the fallen world. And he asks this, this question. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. And, and so God likens himself here uh, to a mother who has a nursing child. And there's no mother who uh, it will forget her nursing child. God says, no, that's impossible. Uh, and my love for you is like that, right? Uh, and well, perhaps um, there may be some bad parents out there, I mean, who do neglect their children. Yet, surely I will not forget you, he says. So he's trying to speak of sort of the ultimate love that human beings can relate to, the love between a, a mother and a child. He says, verse 16, see, I have inscribed you in the palms of my hands. And so maybe this is an allusion to his crucifixion, right? What would happen 700 years later after, he, after this was written by Isaiah? He says, I have inscribed you in the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your sons shall make haste. 
your destroyers and those who laid you waste shall go away from you. Lift up your eyes and look around and see all these gather together and come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourselves with them all as an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does. He essentially says here that there's going to be uh, this this incredible work of God uh, and you're going to return to your land. It's You're going to dwell in my presence. I've not forgotten you. I'm at work. Um, and uh, just as there's celebration at a wedding, he mentions the bride there in verse 18. And so celebrate that you are the bride of Christ. Celebrate that you are now married to me. Verse 19, he says, For your waste in desolate places in the land of your destruction will even now be too small for the inhabitants. And those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children will, uh, you will have after you have lost the others, will say again in your ears, This place is too small for me. Give me a place where I may dwell. Then you will say in your heart, Who has begotten all these children? Since I have lost my children and am desolate, a captive, and, a, and, a, and wandering to and fro. And who has brought these up? There I was, left alone. But these, where did they come from? And so again, speaking here in the context uh, of of Israel. And so there they were in captivity in Babylon, right? And many of the ethnic Jews had been killed, uh, were deported, uh, and the nation you know, had been conquered. But the picture here that God presents is, he says, no, no, I, I'm, I've got this. I love you. I'm over this. I'm at work. And you're going to return to the promised land. And of course, we know that they did do that eventually after 70 years. But that itself was a picture of God's people, the church, coming to live in his presence in the new Jerusalem, right, that we read about in, at the end of Revelation. Uh, and so just as they were exiled and returned from Babylon to Jerusalem, so we, mankind, who are in exile to sin, are redeemed by Christ, and we return to the new heavens, the new earth, to Jerusalem to worship God. And the picture here he describes, he says, is that oh, so? So while some of the Jews have been killed and exiled and all that, he says at the, at the end of time, that and when God's people flow in to worship Him, you know this innumerable company of saints that John sees in Revelation, who are worshiping God, he says there's going to be so many people that there's not even going to be room for them in, in Jerusalem, and you're going to be asking yourself, like, hey, where did all these people come from? And who begot them? And who fathered them? Right? I mean. It's, I mean, where did all these, these folks come from, right? It, and so th this is this, this surprise of joy that is coming. And so, I, you know, I know that in the world that, that we're in, you know, it's, it's hard, right? It's always hard. It's difficult. It's challenging. We're, we have sinful coworkers and neighbors and people in our families. Uh, and there's sickness and illness and natural disasters and evil and cancer and all these things. But understand this, right? just as God was patient with you and I, he was merciful and he was long-suffering until he redeemed us. So God is merciful and he's long-suffering uh, toward those who are even inflicting us now, towards the lost, uh, towards your uh, unredeemed spouse, toward your, you know, your kids who aren't yet saved, towards your, your boss who marginalizes you because of your faith. God's patient and he's long-suffering towards these who don't yet know him, that there may be time for them to be redeemed and to press into the kingdom of God. Uh, and so, again, don't forget this principle, right? You know, God always saves his best for last. Uh, and so be patient, be encouraged. God has got this just as he was patient with you when you were lost. So rejoice that he's patient with those who are not yet redeemed who maybe are even making your life miserable in the here and now, right? Uh, rejoice that God is patient with them and that, that there's still time for repentance and understand that through our patience, and God has promised us these great things at the end uh, and he saves his best for last. Well, verse 22 through verse 26, the Lord goes on here and he says a bit more uh, about um, what he's doing and who he is uh, and, and why his people can be encouraged. He's not abandoned them. He's working in them and through them and for them. He says, verse 22, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will lift my hand in an oath to all the nations and 
set up my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your sons um, in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you in their faces to the earth, and lick up the dust of your feet. And then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. And so it's this picture in, of, in their context, the lost, the Gentiles, and, you know, coming to them at the at the end, right? And this is what will happen to us when we are in the New Jerusalem in his presence. He says that even those who formerly persecuted you, you know, kings and queens, he refers to there, that even they uh, will assist you, that they will carry your children, that they uh, will be your fellow servants. He says, verse 24, shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of the righteous delivered? You know, obviously, obviously not. And so here he's just calling us again to, to wait, to wait on him. And we won't be ashamed if we just carry on. Uh, you know, God needs us to be faithful. Uh, he, he needs us just to put one foot in front of the other and to keep going uh, in our worship of him and our knowledge of him and our service to him. It's hard. It's hard most days, right? Uh, but he's promised us these great things in and through Christ. And we can testify that we have tasted and seen that he is good. And so if we know he's good, we need to uh, carry on and persevere with him. Verse 25, he says, But thus says the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible be delivered, for I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. I will feed those who oppress you, and I will do so with their own flesh. And they shall be drunk with their own blood, as with sweet wine. All flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Right? And so, you know, it's never right for us to say, I told you so. Right? But God says here that one day, even your enemies, they will know that you told them so. Uh, and the evidence will be before them. God says, it's going to be okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contend with those who contend with you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. And so put your faith and your trust in me. And so in this passage, we have all types of th kind of things going on here, right? We've got in the then current context, we've got Israel in captivity being promised of liberation, which God did liberate them uh, via the work of this suffering servant. We then have, you know, these, these promises that are made much more broadly to us, the church. And he's saying, hey, if, at the end of the age, I'm going to um, I'm going to bring you into myself, and I'm going to provide for you, and I'm going to take care of you. And we've also got this description of salvation in the here and now, how you and I have been redeemed via the work of the servant. Now God, God's got our backs. He's taking care of us. And as Paul says, and the worst thing that could happen to us uh, is that we die and go and be with him. And so um, let me encourage you, uh, take a long range of view of things. Don't become distracted. Don't become discouraged by the suffering in the here and now, by the anxiety uh, of the, the current cultural context. No, look unto Christ. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, uh, and he indeed will provide and protect us as we serve him. Be encouraged this week, believers. I'm looking forward uh, to our next study, and so I'll see you. Uh, and um, our next chapter of Isaiah. Have a great week. I hope that you've enjoyed this Bible teaching. I wanted to invite you to like and to subscribe to this broadcast on the app or the website that you're currently using. As a reminder, when you take time to like and to subscribe to The Redeemed Mind, you help others like you find this Bible teaching. Also, I wanted to encourage you to visit the website redeemedmind.com where you'll find Bible commentary that you can use in your own study of God's Word. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again.